Let's cross uh, to London and uh, human rights researcher uh, Azade Porzand, who is at SOAS at the University uh, of London. Thank you for speaking with us here uh, on France 24. I don't know if you heard that in the background uh, uh, while our correspondent there uh, was uh, speaking from the, the Iranian capital. What have you been able to parse together as far as this 40th day uh, since the death of Masa Amini has gone? Um, yes, um, as uh, uh, your correspondent also mentioned, uh, it's uh, it's an impressive uh, 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 crowd of uh, people, not only in the birthplace of Gina Massa Amini Sarkis, but also in uh, other cities in, in Iran, uh, such as Esfahan, Shiraz, and, and Tehran. And uh, But I believe that uh, for those of us who closely follow the situation on the ground, uh, we expected uh, that these res resilient, courageous um, women and Iranian people will um, get uh, set out on the streets in order to, uh, you know, mourn and celebrate uh, uh, their national hero, heroine, uh, Gina Massa Amini, and to also uh, continue to express their grievances against the government. Uh, what I have to say here, though, between mid-September until today, the protests, the strikes, and the various forms of civil disobedience uh, in objection to the Islamic Republic did not stop and uh, perhaps didn't make it as much to international news. However, uh, both resistance and also the killings and the detaining of thousands and thousands of individuals, including children, have continued ever since uh, Gina's Massa's death. That slogan, women, life, freedom, what does it mean to you personally? Well, for me, uh, f uh, first of all, honoring the fact that it's actually a, um, a Kurdish slogan that made its way uh, into Farsi language and into the you know, mass protests that we see today, uh, uh, that's important because it comes from a highly targeted um, minority of the country and one of the largest, the Kurdish minority. But also the fact that uh, I think women are the leaders and at the forefront of this movement that some now argue has reached uh, its, um, a, you know, in a way, a revolutionary um, stage may take long, but it's now in a way beyond protest movement. Uh, women want di di uh, dignity, uh, equality, and freedom, uh, and they want uh, life, essentially, in, a, in an environment that has been so repressive that has re literally robbed life from uh, its people. However, because of 25 plus years of reform and attempts to fail, attempts to reform the system, uh, I think many agree, and all the protesters agree, that women's rights, right to life, and uh, a dignified life for Iranians is not possible for as long as freedom is achieved for the greater nation and freedom is not possible at this stage for as long as the Islamic Republic is ruling the country. You mentioned uh, minorities being targeted. 48 hours ago, there was Iran's Tasnim news agency uh, uh, claiming that uh, two, uh, that unidentified gunmen had killed two revolutionary guards in the southeast, at the other end of the country, uh, this is in uh, Sistan, Baluchistan. Uh, what was your reaction when you heard that news? And and again, this this targeting of minorities. Why, when as you describe it, it's about uh, dignity and women's rights at the outset. <clears throat> Uh, yes, well, it's really beyond women's rights uh, at this point. It's about uh, basically a nation's quest, in my opinion, for um, uh, regime change. Uh, but also, uh, I would take, you know, uh, things that uh, appear on, on uh, narratives that appear on things like Tasnim News, which are very clearly affiliated with uh, the Islamic Republic with a grain of salt. And... Um, uh, the fact that this government has shown no willingness to uh, uh, for accountability for uh, you know uh, responding to the atrocities that it has uh, done against its people against the minorities against women against the larger population for years like I said, I would be cautious about uh, reading too literally into these narratives and in terms of the in terms of the minorities well uh, I think because you know, for, for many years, um, you know, this uh, Islamic Republic has ruled by sort of 
uh, you know, divide and rule uh, approach, uh, scaring uh, those in the center, Tehran, Esfahan, Shiraz, and others, that, you know, if the minorities in the border areas, such as the Kurds, such as the Baluch, such as the Ahwazi Arabs or the Azerbaijanis, rise up, uh, Iran will become a Syria-like scenario, disintegrated, and we will basically lose the nation, the wonderful nation that we have. I think what has shown, what this movement ever since uh, mid-September has shown is that uh, such a scenario seems far from a uh, possibility because people in Tehran rise up for people in Kurdistan, people in Kurdistan rise up for people in Baluchistan, and so on. And so we see uh, a, a sense of unity that is unprecedented, both in terms of women and men and the people of Iran, uh, in terms of different minority groups and the center, and in terms of those inside the country mm. As evident in uh, the very large protests outside the country, Iranians outside the country, such as the Berlin protests or, you know, the protests in, in, in Canada, in Toronto. Yeah, it was a big protest last Saturday in the German capital. Uh, as I think, Porzan, let's talk about that international uh, reaction. Uh, we've had uh, the uh, United States' special envoy on Iran who's been speaking to us, uh, uh, Robert Malley, who uh, tells Mark Perlman of more sanctions. We're announcing uh, a slew of new sanctions, which are going to be aimed at uh, leaders of the IRGC that have been directly involved in the crackdown across the country, prison people, prison officials who've been responsible, in particular the notorious Evan prison. Uh, and we're going up and down the chain, high-level officials, but also lower-level officials who've been involved in, in violent suppression of protesters who may have thought that they could hide behind the anonymity, but we're going to name and shame them as well. And at the same time, we're going after those who are trying to censor and surveil the Iranian people, the Iranian protesters. As I did, Porzan, do those sanctions matter to the regime? Uh, yes, I believe they matter. Um, even if, uh, to a degree, uh, there's, they may be symbolic in nature, they, they send a very strong signal to the Islamic Republic. Not only, not only the United States, as we see it, for example, with Canada, with uh, other um, Western countries, that you know a, a, a threshold of tolerance has has been reached really by um, by the West in terms of tolerating the atrocities of Iran um, against its own people, and that uh, you know Iran was given very many chances until recently there was going to be another um, attempt at the JCPOA. And so I think the space, the international space for the Islamic Republic is really becoming minimized by the day. This is a government that while um, uh, repressive and undemocratic, it, it has uh, loved and at points successfully tried to pretend at an international level to be a legitimate government with some elements of, of, of democracy. And at this point, I think there is no mystery to the world. We always knew that, but I think that at this point, there is no mystery to the world that this is not not the case and that this is an illegitimate uh, regime and um, uh, I think this is in a way a nightmare scenario for the Islamic Republic even if they um, claim and pretend otherwise in their usual propaganda narratives. Azadeh Porzan, many thanks for speaking with us from London. Thank you.